What's going on, everybody? You're listening to Trail Tales, episode number two, and today we have on a very special guest, my friend Taylor Norton. Taylor is fresh off of a thru-hike of the Vermont Long Trail, which is about a 270-mile trail that runs from the Vermont-Massachusetts border pretty much straight up the state, up the spine of the Green Mountains, all the way to the uh, Vermont-Canadian border. Taylor and I first met each other this past summer when I was hiking the AT, and that's because the AT and the Long Trail are actually the same trail throughout southern Vermont. I've hiked the Long Trail a couple times, as you'll find out in this episode, and it was really great to just kind of reminisce about some of our favorite parts of the trail. We also got into some of Taylor's gear, some of his favorite towns, and uh, yeah, we pretty much just cover it all. Anyways... If you want to contact me for whatever reason, say, I don't know, Kyle, I keep hearing this weird background noise on your audio. What is that? It's actually my chair. I need to get a new office chair. Anyway, say you want to contact me. Say you want to call me out for something. Or maybe you want to say something positive. Maybe you like the show. Maybe you think I'm doing a good job because clearly I don't know what I'm doing. And you appreciate my effort. Whatever it is, if you want to contact me. I'm on Instagram and Twitter, at TrailTalesPod, and you can also send me an email, TrailTalesPod at gmail.com. So, yeah, hit me up, let me know what's good. If you have any suggestions for guests or trails you want me to cover, that would be awesome. I'd love to hear it. Or even if you just want to say hi, you know, drop me a line. My inbox is empty because... Well, I mean, at the time of this recording, I haven't even launched any episodes yet, so that's probably why, but, you know, I still want to hear from you. Anyways, let's jump into it with Taylor Norton, and let's talk about the 270-mile Vermont Long Trail. Okay, we're on. We're doing it. All right. I'm here with Taylor Norton. Long trail hiker. He hiked the uh, Vermont Long Trail here in 2018. Taylor and I met each other on the southern part of the Long Trail. Um, what was it? When did we we first met in Manchester Center? Is that is that correct? Yeah. Well, I met uh, Mullet on the top of Stratton. Um, he was looking for people to split a room with, or he he was saying that you guys were looking for people to split a room with, and then I ended up meeting you guys in Manchester Center. Yeah, okay, that's right. So for those of you who don't know, the Appalachian Trail and the Long Trail coincide for, it's about 100 miles, right, from the Vermont-Massachusetts border up to just just north of uh, Killington. Yeah, to be exact, I think it's like 104.5, but yeah. Yeah, so I was in the middle of this fucking crazy Appalachian trail through hike. And, uh, that's when Taylor kind of came in. And, um, I don't think I've mentioned before that I've actually hiked the long trail a couple times. I'm from Vermont. I'm recording this in Vermont right now. And, uh, I had done it once in sections when I was in high school and I did it again as a through hike two years ago in 2016. So, Needless to say, uh, I know quite a bit about the long trail, and um, I'm pretty excited to have Taylor here talking with me about this today. Um, so yeah, thanks for taking the time, man. I really appreciate it. Uh, glad we got those technical difficulties out of the way there. And um, yep. why don't we jump right into it? So I guess to start, I kind of wanted to talk about some of your previous hiking, outdoor, backpacking, whatever experience. You know, how much time had you spent? on long di- or long distance trails or any sort of hiking um backcountry uh adventures before that you had yeah totally um so i had a decent amount of backpacking experience before i did the long trail um but never any like long distance trail experience um i as a kid went on a couple of trips with a company called wilderness adventures um where i went backpacking through various parts of the west um, and kind of fell, fell in love with it via that. Um, eventually in college, I went on to backpack different sections of the long trail. Um, and then the summer after my junior year of college, I worked for wilderness adventures as a backpack backcountry wilderness guide. Um, and yeah, that was pretty much my experience before I started the hike. Um, I'd always 
kind of been intrigued by long distance through hiking um, as soon as I learned about what the AT was when I was probably 12 or 13 years old, um, but never had the right opportunity to do it. Um, so when the opportunity came uh, at the end of last summer, I decided to just take it. Now, you said you had done some previous sections of the long trail. Um, what like specific sections had you done? Like how many miles? I just kind of want to get a feel for how familiar you were with it like before you set out. Yeah, totally. Um, so I had day hiked a number of sections, um, but the one section I kind of overnighted um, or spent, you know, a couple days on was the Mansfield to Camel's Hump section. Um, and the first time I did that was with UVM's orientation hiking group called Trek. Um, we actually went um, up to from the Smuggler's Notch Road up to a place called Sterling Pond. And then over the course of four or five days, worked our way to the base of Camel's Hump. And then I decided to do that again on my own a couple of years after. But I started at the base of Mansfield, went up and over that, and then finished at the summit of Camel's Hump, hiked down and had some pe- some friends pick me up at the parking lot. Okay, cool. So that's a pretty tough section. I mean, the whole trail is, is pretty tough, I would say. Yeah, I think most people would agree. It's a lot of up and down. But um, I mean that's that section's no joke. Uh, I guess it's it's pretty cool that you kind of jumped in right there. I mean it makes sense too because um you went to University of Vermont here in Burlington, so yeah, that's the I would say that's probably the closest like stretch of the long trail to Burlington. So yeah, it was easy to get my friends to get a, get me a ride there. So that was you know proximity was a a big factor. Right. So um, can you just talk a little bit about some of the like uh initial preparation like like uh shortly before you left you know what was your did you have like a timeline um like what were your expectations uh, just yeah so um i kind of had to jump right into it because i was working out in wyoming working for wilderness adventures all summer um and i got back and had about a week to prepare um kind of prior to the summer I had bought gut hooks and that was kind of like my initial investment into the trail and I was that's when I really decided I wanted to do it you were locked in um yeah exactly um but once I got back from my summer job I just had about a week um and spent that time kind of uh thinning out what I was gonna bring with me um measuring my base weight uh figuring out what my resupplies were I had done a lot of reading that kind of planning out your day to day, you were pretty much going to, you know, give up that schedule within the first couple of days. So there was no point in doing that. So I just focused on my resupplies, pack weight, um, and figuring out how I was going to get to the start of the trail and how I was going to get picked up at the end. Right. Well, it sounds like you were pretty well prepared then. Um, I mean, I can attest to the fact that you were just from the fact that we hiked together for a couple of days. <laughs> Thanks. Um, but no, that's cool. Um, so kind of funny. Now, I remember I was in, I think I, I must have been in New Hampshire at this point. Yeah, well, I was definitely in New Hampshire at this point because uh, anyways, I got this message on Reddit from like a random user. I don't get many messages yep. on Reddit. So I went to look at it and sure enough, it was from you. Uh, I had posted a picture, I guess it was two years ago after I had through hiked the long trail, uh, just on the long trail subreddit. Uh, just, it was just me standing at the end of the trail, you know, celebration finished, blah, blah, blah. And Taylor had actually gone on the subreddit and sorted the posts by, I guess it was, was it like most upvoted or? It was like upvoted of most upvoted of all time. Yeah. Cause I was, it was just like kind of, I had just gotten back from the trail. I was kind of reminiscing going through other people's experiences. And I did that. And sure enough, your face popped up on my screen and I was like, holy shit. <laughs> it's pretty funny. It's pretty funny how that works. Yeah. Um, anyways, so through that, I saw the picture that you had posted as well and just kind of reading the comments and stuff. I remember somebody had asked you to just kind of give like a recap or something like that um, about your hike. And one of the things you had mentioned is that you weren't eating enough at the start and I feel really weird saying this, like I'm stalking your Reddit or something, but... No, 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 you're good. <laughs> One of the things you had said was um, you had kind of wondered why the Appalachian Trail hikers, so I'm assuming, you know, us that you were hiking with uh, at the beginning of the trail while the two trails were still coinciding, um, you had mentioned that you were kind of wondering why we had so much food and that over the course of the hike, you kind of realized you weren't eating enough. 
So right. I kind of wanted to ask if there was like, I, I guess, could you speak to that? And were there any like other things that you learned from like the Appalachian Trail hikers that you were around on that first part of the trail that you kind of uh, took with you for the rest of the hike? Totally. Yeah. Well, I mean, that first experience of seeing like everyone's huge food bag. So my first night I didn't camp at a shelter, but my second night I did. Um, and I looked in one of the bear boxes and I was like, holy crap, everyone's food bags are like twice as the size of mine. Um, and those first few days I felt like I was being fed plenty. Um, but quickly thereafter I was realizing why those food bags were so big. Um, all of a sudden I kind of got the hiker hunger. Um, and I just felt like I needed way more food than I had ever eaten. And all of a sudden I went from eating about like 2,500 calories a day to closer to five to six. Um, and that happened. I was surprised at how quickly that happened. Um, so that was kind of the first thing that opened my eyes when I was experiencing eight teeth through hikers for the first time. Um, but yeah, I mean, just kind of the little details of the through hiking lifestyle. Um, I picked up here and there from you guys specifically. Um, it's kind of hard to pinpoint different things, but I just kind of would have watch what you were doing and kind of adapt to what, you know, I typically did to that. Um, and felt like I had become a pretty adept at the lifestyle by the time I finished. Right. Um, had you ever hitchhiked before you set out to do the long trail? Uh, once before, um, I was trying to get from white river junction to Burlington via Greyhound bus. Um, I missed the bus and ended up hitchhiking with a, uh, army ranger. Um, who works at Smuggler's Notch. So that was pretty fun. That's pretty funny because I've never hitchhiked like in a different context than uh, hiking. Now, were, yeah. were you like legit like standing on the side of the road with your thumb out during this or did you just kind of like run into him in town and like manage to get a ride that way? No, actually, uh, it's a bit of a funny story. So I was uh, sitting in the Greyhound station. I was there probably 45 minutes before the bus was supposed to leave. Um, waiting for the woman to announce that the bus was there and she never did. And the bus came and went, um, I kind of maybe lost my temper at her a little bit. And this guy kind of saw that and thought it was hilarious and decided, <laughs> you know, he was heading up that way. Roughly. He decided he'd give me a ride. Nice guy. Nice guy. Yeah. yeah. I was going to say, cause I mean, I'm sure there's people out there that like hitchhike just wherever, I mean, maybe there is, right. I don't know. I don't really know anyone that does, but I'm sure there are no, people out there, but personally, yeah. I probably would not do that unless I was in the context of a, of a hike of some sorts. Yeah. It feels a lot more comfortable with a backpack on your back for some reason. Yeah. And when you're standing next to a trailhead in a town that people are used to seeing hikers in, um, right. cause it's kind of weird because that's one thing I always try to explain to people that aren't really familiar with long distance backpacking. Um, cause when you, when you tell people you're hitchhiking, like I remember the first time I told my mom, which was right before I did the AT, I never told her about any of my hitchhiking before that. Um, you, you have to explain to people that it's not the same as you just standing out in the middle of nowhere on some road, like trying to get to another city, right? You're, you're right. standing by a trailhead. You look like a hiker. You've got your poles, your backpack. People understand what you're doing. Locals are used to seeing the hikers come through and you're going to get picked up by somebody who wouldn't normally pick up, you know, some guy in the middle of the, in the middle of nowhere, you know, standing on the side of the road with a backpack on. It's a lot right. different. And I, yeah, I found that especially to be true in the Southern section. Um, in the Northern section, it was a little different because there's less of a kind of trail town culture, um, in the Northern part of the long trail. Um, but in the Southern section, it was like, there was a moment where I didn't even put my thumb out someone just kind of pulled up on the side of the road next to me and mullet um and saw us and said you guys look like you need a ride yeah (laughs) yes we do (laughs) exactly that happened to me a couple times on the at as well that's always Nice. nice um so let's see i'm trying to i'm trying to think of the towns that i remember you telling me you were going to go into uh manchester rutland so then the towns uh, north of the AT after the two trails split, I'm assuming you probably went to Waitsfield. I know you said you had a friend in Stowe that picked you up. Yeah. Um, were those the only other two? Yeah, Waitsfield and Stowe. 
Um, yep, those are the only other two, I okay, believe. Okay, cool. So, and I'm assuming, you, obviously, you didn't have to hitchhike in Stowe because your friend was there. So, Waitsfield was really the only other time that you had to hitchhike, correct? Right. Okay. How how was the hitch into Waitsfield from uh, Appalachian Gap, right? Yep, App Gap. Um, it you know at first it was a little discouraging because there wasn't much traffic coming yeah, through. Really I got to the trailhead. Yeah, and I got to the trailhead about you know it was probably noon or one because um, I only had roughly nine miles to do that day, um, and I it started out great. There was trail magic at the trailhead. Um, there was like a whole case of long trail beer. Um, so that was like an awesome sight. Um, but I probably sat there for an hour with no luck. And then finally someone drove up who was setting up for uh, a bike race in the area. Um, and he offered me a ride into town. It actually turned out that he was, uh, good friends with one of my friends from the area, um, that I had worked with over the summer. So it was kind of a bit of an awesome coincidence. Um, yeah, so I got into town, got some pizza, got some beer, got a burger too, <laughs> and then hitched another ride to my hostel from there, which was no problem. Okay. So I want to jump back to the start of your hike again. Um, so as you said, you were planning on doing it in 17 days. And I remember when you had first told me that, like, hear me out. Like when you had like literally just finished saying it, um, before I, I heard the rest of your, uh, the rest of your plans. Um, I thought that was a little bit fast. I mean, it's certainly been done before, but, um, yeah, you know, I was, I was just a little skeptical, but then after (laughs) you had told me, you know, how many miles you had already done to get to this point, you know, when you had started, I was like, okay, all right, I guess, I guess you can do it. Um, so, but, but regardless, 17 days is pretty fast to do the long trail. Um, for those of you who don't know, the long trail is about 270 miles, give or take 272, maybe. I'm not sure how that reroute they just put in. I think now it's technically 273, but everywhere, every source I check gives me a different number. So yeah, I don't know what to you never it. know for sure, right? Yeah. Um, but anyway, so yeah, 17 days over pretty difficult terrain, um, covering that amount of miles is definitely not easy. Um, I know that you kept pace with us who had at that point been hiking uh, well over 1,500 miles already. We're obviously in really good shape, a pretty condition to walking 20 plus mile yeah. days every day. And uh, you were able to keep up with us pretty much the entire time. Not pretty much. You were able to keep up with us the entire time right. um, that we were on the same trail there. So were you, uh, how, how did you feel like once we split up, um, did the big miles catch up to you at all? Like, did you feel good? Um, like you were able to maintain that pace obviously, but uh, did it come at a price? Like, how did you feel? Yeah, so those first few days, uh, I kind of felt like I could do anything. Um, I had spent the summer uh, guiding backpacking trips at elevation, so I felt like fairly well conditioned. But uh, I had never done, you know, days over 15 miles. Um, So it was kind of awesome to feel like I could do those 20-mile days in those first few days. Uh, But then pretty much as soon as I split off from you guys um, in Rutland, uh, I started having problems. Um, so I actually developed patellar tendonitis. Oh boy. Um, in, I want to say my right knee. I can't really remember anymore. Um, and that slowed me down big time for a few days. So that day I was planning on doing 20 miles and I only ended up doing about maybe 10, but I learned how to manage it. Um, and it, kind of subsided after three or four days it was never really gone until probably the last section of my hike um but i think starting out as aggressive as i did was ultimately somewhat detrimental um and then probably you know 10 days into the hike i had a quick bout of achilles tendonitis for maybe four days um so it was kind of like one thing after the next, but it was never unmanageable. It slowed me down in certain sections, but I was still able to keep the pace that I wanted to keep. Um, I just kind of had to plan out rest days more accordingly um, and really focused on staying off my feet when I could. Did you, or how many days did you take off 
over the course of your through hike? Um, I never actually zeroed. Um, I so I was hiking every single day, at least some. But I took a couple Neros. Like what? Anytime I was going into town, um, I tried to make sure that it was going to be a short day, so I could spend lots of time in the hostel or at my friend's house or wherever I was staying, just sitting on a couch, icing uh, my injuries and kind of making sure my legs would be fresh for the next day. The, the Neros are pretty clutch. We did a lot of Neros on the AT, especially in the first part, the first half of the trail. Um, I, I'm pretty sure I only took off, I want to say like five or I maybe mean, like six or seven days uh, for the first, wow. you know, thousand plus miles, which is that's pretty good. It's pretty aggressive. Yeah, I, I definitely took a lot more zeros in the second part, um, especially once we got into the harder terrain. But uh I mean, the, the Neros are good. Nero, for those of you who don't know, is just like a, it's 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 supposed to stand for like nearly zero, but people kind of stretch it to mean whatever that means, like for their mileage. So for me, yeah. only like a 10 mile day would probably be considered a Nero, but for some people, 10 miles is like a full day. So they would hear me call 10 miles as a Nero and they would think I was crazy, but that's pretty much, yeah. it just means like a half day or, you know. Yeah, you spend half the day hiking, you spend half the day in town or whatever. Um, whatever that means for you exactly. and your abilities. All right, so I want to talk about just like what some of your favorite parts of the long trail are. I, I fucking love the long trail. It's where I learned what backpacking, what hiking was. Um, like I said at the beginning of the podcast, I know the entire trail extremely well. I know every single shelter, just about every single spot because uh, I've spent so much time on it. So I always like to hear... Like what other people's like favorite spots were like any like memories that stick out from any shelters, campsites, towns, uh, even you know, just any like what, what were your favorite parts of the trail? Oh, yeah, there are so many favorite parts. It's like hard to narrow it down. But uh, things that stick out to me the first time I hitched into a trail town, which was uh, Manchester Center, um, Mullet and I uh, ended up hitching in the back of a pickup truck. The classic uh, hitch downtown. Hike. I yeah. love it. Yeah, and it was a great first trail hitchhike, um, and it kind of, it was my first resupply, I had never done anything like that before, and it, that was kind of when I realized, like, I'm doing it, like, I'm doing a through hike, this is what it's all about, um, so that was really cool, um, I'd say another really great part for me, um, was making it to Camel's Hump, um, which was a, it's one of the taller mountains on the trail. Um, and I had day hiked it plenty of times, but it felt so much different to have walked from Massachusetts as the approach. Right, right. Um, and the section leading up to Camel's Hump for me was mentally and physically the most challenging. Um, so when I finally did summit and it was like five o'clock at night um, or in the evening, it was just like I kind of broke down a little bit. It was really emotional. Um, so that was pretty amazing on a lighter note, um, resupplying in Waitsfield was great. I went to Bluestone pizza, which is awesome. I got a heady topper, um, and just really enjoyed myself there. Um, that was kind of when the trail was just starting to get difficult or not just starting to get difficult, but just starting to get more difficult. Um, so that resupply was really nice. Um, and then also, I guess, watching the sunrise from puffer shelter yes i was gonna Hilton. ask you about puffer yeah yeah puffer i had stayed there before um or actually no i hadn't stayed there before i had eaten lunch there before on one of my other section hikes um but i had never gotten the chance to sleep there it ended up being really crowded because it was on like i don't know one of the holiday weekends i can't remember which one um and there was you know probably two couples sleeping in the shelter there was another group um camping above the shelter there was a tent behind the shelter and then i set up my tent next to the shelter as well um so it was pretty busy but up until that point the long trail section of the trail after i disconnected from the at had been pretty quiet um so i it was i was kind of welcoming it um so i had a fun evening there kind of socializing and then waking up uh, my tent just looked right out on the sunrise over the green mountains and it was pretty special. That's such an awesome spot. Uh, uh, yeah, I'll say puffer shelter is definitely my favorite spot on the whole trail. Um, I've stayed there two times 
the first time I stayed there when I was section hiking the long trail. So this was, oh God, this was 2012. I was 16 at the time. And uh, it was just me and a couple buddies. And it was my second backpacking trip ever. So I really wasn't too, like, too comfortable or familiar with uh, yeah. the lifestyle, I guess. Yeah, we were only out for a couple days. But I mean, when you're, when you're 16, that's a lot. And um, we had the place to ourselves. And uh, again, it was a clear day beautiful beautiful sunrise there it's for for anybody who finds themselves at puffer shelter someday it's um the shelter itself is not very nice it's pretty small and kind of old and there's really not much for other camping spots around it i was kind of surprised to hear you say that you got a couple tents set up there yeah there was like one little spot next to the shelter there was kind of one little spot where someone put a bivy behind the shelter and then there was someone kind of managed to find a flat spot um, maybe, you know, a hundred feet above the shelter on the trail. But no, there's, there's really not much room. And like I said, the shelter is not nice. I mean, I shouldn't say it's not nice, but it's not the nicest shelter. I'll no, say but that. it's not the nicest. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but it's right on this cliff and you're up pretty high too. You're just, you're only like a half mile from the summit of Bolton mountain, which is almost 4,000 feet. I think it's just under 4,000 feet. So it's a yep. big mountain. And, uh, puffer shelter is you know so close to the top that like it's there's just such a nice view i mean that's that sounds so like generic to say on a hiking podcast but it's so damn true man that spot is unbelievable um i live so close to it now i feel like i gotta go back at some point maybe i will it's kind of tough to day hike too because it's a little bit out there but such a nice spot and the sunrise is unbelievable highly recommended if uh, if anyone's ever in the area and they need a place to do an overnight or whatever or if you're through hiking obviously um, I gotta say my other favorite spot on the trail, at least a uh, shelter camping wise is definitely Stark's Nest. Did you stay there at all? Uh, I did not stay at Stark's Nest. Uh, I had lunch there. Um, just the timing didn't work out for me, um, for the kind of the way this, I split up the days. Um, I think that was, that's on the top of Mad River Glen, right? Yep. That was my, uh, the day that I was kind of trying to get into town. Yeah. Cause that, yeah, that's not too far from a uh, app gap, right? Yep. Um, so I can't exactly remember what shelter I stayed before that, but it ended up being about 10 miles from my shelter, nine or 10 miles from my shelter to app gap. Um, so it was kind of the perfect stopover point before the descent down into town. Yeah. Stark's nest. Can't recommend it enough. Another awesome spot on the trail. It's, um, it's, at the top of a ski lift for Mad River Glen, as Taylor just said. Um, and the ski resort there is nice enough to let hikers stay in like their little hut on the top. They leave it unlocked. It's really nice in there. There's a ton of room. There's a view because you're on a ski trail and things are clear cut, obviously. And they even... Was the uh, was the water barrel still there when you went through? Oh, yeah. They had the water barrel and they even had a privy. So, so awesome. It was fully equipped. It's like they yeah they put this water barrel up there so it just collects rainwater and then there's like a little hose so you can get water. I mean you're on the top of this mountain and uh, there's water literally right outside the door of the shelter. A little hose you can even spray off your legs or do whatever the hell you want to do. I don't know. It's yep. a, that that's a really awesome spot. So yeah, it's a pretty dry section of trail, so it was nice to have that. Such a good spot. All right, cool. Um, so I guess. Like, I don't have that much direction with this podcast. We're kind of just shooting the shit. But I'd like to think that people that would potentially listen to this, even though probably no one's going to listen to this, but I'd like to think that the <laughs> people who could potentially listen to this um, would be, like, interested in doing the trail. So uh, kind of targeting people who, you know, haven't done the long trail or the AT and um, are kind of, like, trying to prepare. I know I always found podcasts and youtube videos and you know blog posts and stuff like that helpful when i was uh, preparing for different hikes so um i guess what advice would you have for other people who might be looking to do a long trail through hike in the future totally um i'd say you know listen to podcasts like this one go out there and like watch youtube accounts of other people's through hikes um a lot of that information regardless of the trail is applicable to any through hike um i learned you know, a lot just from watching videos, um, watching gear breakdowns, stuff like that in my free time before doing the trail. Um, I would say once you're on the trail, take your time. Um, 
there's no reason to start the way I did. Um, although I was glad I did it at the pace that I did. I really enjoyed kind of the challenge. Um, but take your time, smell the roses, um, and really listen to your body. Um, if you're feeling like you're developing injury, take the time off that you need to take off. Don't try to push it. Um, and I would say pack weight is very key. Um, don't try to bring a bunch of luxury items just because you think you're really strong and you can do it. Um, yeah, the, the lighter your pack is, the happier you're going to be regardless of how tough you are. Um, so yeah, keep that in mind. So how about, we kind of talked about some of the towns before, but, um, did I, did I, I don't think I asked you what your favorite town along the trail was, did I? Ooh, no. Um, that's, t- I would say it was probably Rutland just cause, um, uh, it was kind of the last chance to hang out with all the guys I met on the AT. Um, we went to a couple bars, played some pool. Um, the yellow deli was a wild experience. That place that is crazy. Probably be, yeah. <laughs> could probably be an entire episode on its own. Um, but yeah, it was just kind of, it was wild. Uh, I really enjoyed my time there, which I was kind of from what I knew about Rutland previously, I was like, not super excited. For about those of you who there. don't know, Rutland does not have a very good reputation among Vermonters. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Uh, but I, that was a lot of fun. I really enjoyed the yellow deli and everything that had to offer kind of the trail community felt really strong there. Um, and just being able to kind of walk around town and go to some bars was a lot of fun. Yeah. The yellow deli is such an interesting place. Um, if, if you're familiar with the Appalachian trail or the Appalachian trail culture, I should say through hiking the AT in general, you've probably heard of the yellow deli before, but, um, what it is is it's a free hostel for hikers to stay in. It's right in downtown Rutland. Um, It's like right on the main strip. It's it's an awesome location. You're really close to Walmart to go get your your groceries or whatever. There's a bunch of restaurants right there. I mean, it it is literally a deli and a hostel. So there's literally a restaurant downstairs. And um, it's kind of interesting. It's run by this religious group called 12 Tribes. People call them a cult a lot of the time, which... I'm not going to speak to that because I don't really know much about cults or religion or yep. any of that stuff. But um, it's, I mean, they're, they're a religious organization and uh, it's, it was definitely a weird vibe. Although I must say I was a lot more skeptical before I got there because I stayed, I stayed the night that you hiked out because um, I was with my right. other friends before and um, I was kind of skeptical going into it. I had been there before when I, I had hiked the long trail, but I didn't stay. I just kind of stopped in for lunch and, um, it was kind of a weird vibe, but I got to say after I like spent the night with them and everything, uh, it's definitely one of my favorite hostels on the whole trail. If, if you can kind of get past the fact that you're staying with, um, like I said, some people call it a cult religious organization, whatever you want to call it. If you can get past that, I mean, it's a really awesome place to stay that I would highly recommend to anybody who's hiking the Long Trail or the Appalachian Trail and stops in Rutland. It's free, first of all. They gave us like a private room. Um, the deli downstairs is great. And like I said before, the location is awesome. Um, what did you, what did you kind of think of that whole like vibe at the Yellow Deli? Yeah, I mean, walking in for the first time, um, I walked in with Classic. We got a hitch into town together. Um, and we both kind of looked at each other and we're like, what have we just walked into? <laughs> um, it felt like you kind of entered another, it's like you stepped into a time machine or something. Um, everyone's For people that are listening, these, like, just Google it, like Google Yellow Deli and there's pictures of the inside. You'll kind of get what we're talking about. Yeah. Yeah. There's all this like old woodwork um, and everyone who works there is kind of wearing like slightly dated clothing, like farm clothing. Um, and there's like this like kind of old timey like music playing. Um, but I really enjoyed my stay there. Um, it was fun being around so many hikers. Um, I never felt like I was being kind of preached to or anyone was like trying to convert me. It just felt like, uh, it was just part of their religion. Just want to be friendly and help those who were in need. Um, 
and it was great. I mean, I got to do my laundry. They provided clothes for when I was doing that. They fed me in the morning. Um, and then I ended up pitching into town the next day, but there's a lot of options there. Uh, they're really helpful with trying to find you rides or getting you on the bus, uh, out of town. So, um, if I were to do it again, I'd probably stay there again. No, it's an awesome place. I stayed in Rutland two years ago when I did the long trail in case anybody hasn't gotten the memo that I did the long trail two years ago. Um, (laughs) I stayed at one of the motels there that was kind of like on the way back out towards, uh, like back towards the trail, like near the McDonald's. And um, after staying at those hotels and staying at the Yellow Deli, the second time I went through, I can say that the Yellow Deli is definitely better. Uh, I don't remember if I told you, Taylor, but uh, the hotels that we stayed at, they say hotels because there's two hotels right next to to each other. Obviously, we only stayed at one. But um, it was uh, your stereotypical, like, cheap, cheap hotel. Um just oh, yeah. dirty, disgusting, and uh, I definitely had a nice conversation with a guy that was on crack or heroin or something, just kind of <laughs> hanging out outside at night. And he was a nice guy, don't get me wrong, but it was definitely a weird vibe. So Yellow Deli, much better. Stay there if you're ever in Rutland and you're hiking. Okay. Um, all right. So what conversation about hiking would be complete without talking about gear, right? So... I, I remember, I feel kind of pretentious saying this, but I was impressed with your gear, Taylor. Um, I <laughs> Coming from somebody who hadn't done that much hiking before, um, you know, yeah. I, I felt like you had a pretty good setup. You kind of had a, a grip on the lightweight thing. Um, so why don't you just kind of talk a little bit about that? Uh, you know, what were your like big four items, you know, your, the, the brands and stuff? And um, once you go through that, if there was anything you maybe would have done differently gear wise, I think that could be uh, valuable to hear as well. Totally. Um, so for this hike, since it was just 17 days, I tried to do as much as I could with whatever gear I already had. Um, so prior to my hike, I'd watched a lot of videos on just kind of simple tricks to cut pack weight without necessarily... Um, without necessarily, you know, spending a bunch of money on new ultralight gear. Um, Just simple tricks like, you know, just trying to live with as little as possible and not bringing too many luxury Cutting the handle off your toothbrush. Yeah, you know, yeah, to an extent, but also like just a lot of different tricks to simplify uh, your, you know, your cook system, your sleep system. Um, you know, in prior backpacking experiences, I'd always brought like multiple shirts, multiple shorts. Um, and for this, I just brought, you know, a pair of clothes to hike in and a clean pair of clothes to sleep in. Um, as far as my big four go, um, I had a mountain hardware South Cole 70. It's like a pretty big pack. It's not ultralight. It's 70 liters. Um, but I had to have a big pack for, uh, my job, unfortunately. Um, And that, you know, that brought me through the whole trail just fine. Um, My sleep system, I had a Thermarest Neo Air X-Lite, which I loved. Um, I had a sleeping bag that I got a few years ago, actually more like eight years ago. um, That was like an old EMS 35 degree synthetic bag that actually packed down pretty small and pretty light. Um and remind me of what else is oh shelter um so for my shelter i had um a sierra designs high route um which is kind of like a trek somewhat ultralight trekking pole shelter um i didn't bring the bug net in it which cut a lot of weight um just because i knew bugs aren't too bad that time of year in vermont and i never missed it so yeah that was kind of like the bulk of my gear minus you know the clothes all the other random little assorted things. Um, I also brought like a compass, but I'd never used it and probably wouldn't bring it on another th- like trail through hike again. Um, there's a few things I still could probably cut out, but I ended up with about, you know, 15, 16 pound base weight um, by just kind of simplifying my kit and not going out and buying a ton of stuff. I think that's one thing people don't really realize when they talk about ultralight hiking sometimes is uh, people... Some people call it ultra expensive hiking, and it's true that a lot of that ultralight gear is very expensive. However, another big part of ultralight hiking is 
to just not bring the things you don't need. And, you know, when you're not spending extra money on your camp chairs or your expensive stove and all this stuff, you know, you, you can you can save a lot of weight that way too. So ultralight gear is expensive, but you can make up some of that money by not bringing quite as much stuff. Um, the So one last question before we kind of wrap things up here. Um, so just one thing that people will always say about the long trail is how much more difficult the northern part is compared to the southern part. Um, I remember when I was down in Virginia hiking on the AT, um, a ridge runner was talking about the whites and he was talking about the long trail. And I, I don't think he realized that I had hiked in the whites and the northern long trail like pretty extensively. I think he was just kind of blabbing. And he was talking about how the northern part of the long trail was like super super comparable to the whites so he i think he even said it was more difficult than the whites and um interesting i i actually i i guess i should probably ask you have you hiked in the whites at all uh no actually um it's been on my list for a while but for some reason i've just never gotten out there anyway so yeah a lot of people say the northern part of the long trail is you know among the hardest backpacking uh terrain on the east coast at least um, so how, how did you think the Northern part compared to the Southern part? Cause I, I feel like sometimes it, it's definitely more difficult. There's, there's no denying that, but personally, I think sometimes people kind of overhype it. Yeah. Um, for me, it was, it kind of depended on section to section. So there was parts of the Northern section that were, um, just as easy as the Southern section, especially from like kind of smugs to the Lamoille river. Um, that was a really pretty cruisy day. Um, but there were sections that really kind of tested me. Um, the section leading in between app gap and camel's hump, um, was just really rocky and the rocks were all wet from kind of the constant moisture that was in the air at the time. Um, so I had a lot of kind of slips and falls that day. Um, and the trail in the Northern section just gets a lot more rugged. Um, so it starts to become rockier, narrower, narrower, a little more bushwhackier. Um, but like I said, it was kind of section to section for me. So it would be, I'd have like a really difficult day that, um, nothing in the Southern section could compare to. Um, and then I'd have a day where, you know, it was easy going. Um, so I would say the hype is true to an extent, um, but I would say it, it does get over-exaggerated. Right. And there is that one really, really flat section from, I think it's the base of Stratton Mountain all the way into uh, Route 1130 there um, that goes into Manchester Center. I think a lot of people kind of use that as like a as like a base for the southern part of the trail. And that, yep. that I think it's like six or seven miles maybe. That section's definitely easy because it's pretty much just straight flat it was extremely muddy when we went through but that's a different story but um yeah i i I tend to kind of think the southern northern comparison does get overhyped a little bit but like i said before there's definitely no denying that the northern part i would say is definitely more difficult i wouldn't say it's as hard as the whites from my experience but i don't know other people say differently so take that with a grain of salt yeah, they. I mean, they each had their own challenges. I mean, for me, the mud in the south was really, like, it would get super frustrating and really mentally challenging at times. Um, so each section ca- kind of had its own thorn in my side. So yeah, the be- mud was weird because, I mean, Vermont gets the nickname Vermud for AT through yeah. hikers. And I always thought that was kind of bullshit, to be honest. Because um, when I had gone through, because I've actually done that first... Um, 30 miles of the long trail four times now and the first three times i went through i mean yeah it was muddy but it wasn't like anything out of the ordinary i didn't really think much of it but i gotta say the last time i did it you know when we were going through together yeah that was fucking muddy i don't know what was going on there but yeah. they need to they need to put some trail work in there um maybe i'll maybe i'll yeah it was pretty rough. Maybe i'll volunteer with the green mountain club and, and do some trail work because I, f- I feel like i should probably do that at some point after doing so much hiking on these trails. So I'm saying that. So you guys have to hold me to it. (laughs) (laughs) I think part of it too is, uh, 
I was hiking along with the AT bubble at that point. So there was just, there were some storms beforehand. And then just, I think the massive amount of traffic that went through right around the time that I was hiking, it really had an impact. Yeah, I think so. That's a good point. Yeah. I mean, the rest of uh, the AT through Vermont really wasn't too bad. It was only that first, I want to say like 40, 30, 40 miles from the mass border up to Manchester center. That was super muddy. Yeah. Yeah, that that was that was a drag. That was not a fun section. <laughs> I was stoked to make it to Vermont because I'm from Vermont, and I was like, "Fucking walked home, let's go!" And then just mud. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> but it's all good. We made it through. All right, cool, man. Um, so yeah, that's pretty much all I have. Um, thanks for taking the time. Just real quick before I let you go, um, what are your plans as far as uh, future hikes? And I know we were kind of working you at the time. So I kind of want to know, is the AT on your radar at all? Oh, man. I I think it is at some point. Um, I just moved out to uh, South Lake Tahoe, as you know. Um, so I'm going to try to take time off from my job to uh, hike the Tahoe Rim Trail, um, which off the top of my head is something like 150 miles. I'm not sure. Don't hold me to that. Um, but it kind of follows the um, ridge line that surrounds Lake Tahoe. Um and then the next step, I think, is one of the big ones. So for me, it's either going to be the PCT or the AT, um, depending on geographically, which I'm closer to right. at the time. Um, and right now, that's kind of uncertain because I'm always planning on spending this year in Tahoe and then not planning too far ahead of that. <laughs> I gotcha. Well, um, if you do make it out on the Tahoe Rim Trail, I'm going to have to have you back on because I'm trying to do like a lot of different trails uh, for this podcast. And, uh, I really don't know anything about that trail. I've heard it's pretty cool. So, uh, it'd be cool to get some insight on that. Totally. Yeah. I'm planning on doing it in the spring. So I'll, okay, I'll cool. keep in touch. Hell yeah, man. I'm looking forward to uh, seeing the pictures and stuff. So yeah. Um, that's all I got, man. Thank you so much for taking the time or I really appreciate it. I think this went well. Uh, hopefully I don't fuck up the editing too much and it sounds okay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Thanks for having me, man. It was great to talk about it. For sure, man. Um, do you want to plug like any social media links where people can find you at? Uh, yeah, sure. I mean, you can follow me on Instagram at uh, T Norts. That's T N O R T S S. I think. Uh, yeah, that's. I post a lot of pictures of hiking there. Um, that's about it. I'm not too active on social media. All right, cool, man. Well, thanks again, and uh, it was good chatting with you. Yeah, it was great chatting with you, man. <laughs>